Hi, everyone. This is Steve Bell. And uh, welcome to another installment of Ask the Expert. Today, we'll be doing Scripting Best Practices Part 3. For the last two, I have been, last two sessions, I went through some more basic elements of scripting bad practices and how to overcome them, how to replace them uh, or rewrite them. Uh, so that they fell into the realm of best practices. Today, I'll be getting into a few more of these and uh, some of them rather involved and then describing to you some other things concerning um, why the code needs to be restructured a certain way. So we'll be getting a little more into uh, some of the coding side uh, rather than just saying, you know, this is a better way of doing things and then going after it uh, from that perspective. So let's get started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Bell. I am a uh, MVP for the last four years. Um, I am also a, a member of the Expert Bureau, the Advocate Group, and I'm an author out on the community blogs. I've got over 150 articles and a number of videos. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to continuing with the worst practices. Uh, by the way, most of these, if not all of them, come from a live production code and you're going to really raise your eyebrows over some of this stuff i have pulled this off of uh, code that i've seen out in the wild and uh, actually implemented at various customer sites so you get an idea of uh, some of the things that are going on out there if you aren't familiar with them already all right starting with the first one so I don't know how many of you have used Ajax before, but uh, there is a difference uh, between flavors of Ajax. There's one that's called synchronous and another one that's called asynchronous. Synchronous makes the user wait until a server-side call has been completed. The whole point of it, Glide Ajax is to call the server-side, get it to do some heavy lifting and pass back some sort of answer. In this particular case, um, we've got a, uh, uh, Glide Ajax script include called change utils, and in that it has a um, method called validate type. We're passing in a bunch of variables and then waiting. Now that get XML wait is the whole problem, and that particular little animal is the one that makes the user wait as well. So in other words, that is a synchronous call. Synchronous means that it waits on the server and the connection is maintained until the server side completes execution and returns it. By the way, that uh, get answer is kind of an interesting animal as well, but um, I won't get into that here. My preference is what's called get XML answer, and we'll cover that here in a little bit. Anyway, long and short of it is, uh, this is not the desired purpose, and it will cause, more than likely cause, a bad user experience by making the user go get a cup of coffee. So a solution, this is uh, the first one I'll present, is to set up an asynchronous callback. Uh, what does this mean? It means that the user's uh, released. They aren't uh, held back, and they can go on and do other things while the system processes this in the background. Uh, in essence, the get XML uh, is the asynchronous call. The callback is the handle response function. Notice I used an underscore to mean that it's an internal only function, not to be a called from outside. Uh, this is inside of a client script, by the way. And what happens here is that um, the server side is called, and then the user is released, and then the server side does its processing, and when it's done, it calls back, and the handle response then uh, executes. At which point then, <clears throat> in this particular one, we're using a uh, document element uh, get attribute to retrieve the actual information that was sent back. There is a slightly better way of doing this where you don't have to go down that dot walk to get a hold of things. So um, that one I'll show you next. And you can see it's called get XML answer. This is um, my recommended uh, best practice. Uh, what this ends up doing is uh, the response is actually passed through by a parameter and uh, so that if you look at this previous one, the handle response response 
uh, actually has to go out and get the answer via the get attribute statement. This one just passes it through and you can utilize it from that point forward. So this is a lot, lot better. Either solution will be, will work. It'll be fine. This one's easier to maintain. Regardless, these are, these last two are both asynchronous and the preferred method. They do not hold the user up. They do not interrupt the user. They don't force the user to go get a cup of coffee. Okay, next one. This is a lovely little piece of code I found. And all right, first off, a couple of side notes. Don't use gel. There's a number of alternatives to that, and gel is not scope safe. The next thing, the one that I really felt like bringing out here is the stuff in bright red. Uh, notice that uh, the first variable, SID card item, is a uh, undeclared variable, no varring in front of it. Um, there are some built-in variables. This is not one of them. Anyway, uh, a little bit further down, notice that var answer is not done. Uh, this is a uh, asynchronous, or I'm sorry, a synchronous call. So it forces the user to wait anyway. So that's a bad thing. I just got through with that. Um, notice object attachments, num attachments, both are undeclared, not varred. You want to var. Uh, varring uh, in the precompiler for JavaScript as it goes down through, it doesn't have to fill in the blanks. So when you var something, it knows immediately it's supposed to go do that. When you get down and it isn't varred, it does a look back to see if you know this thing actually exists. If it doesn't, then it has to var it for you. Um, there is a slight performance hit. Uh, it gets more and more major as you throw into things like loops and stuff. Always var your variables. Anyway, the uh, other ones in here, um, the uh, alerts uh, are commented out. First off, don't ever use an alert if you can avoid it. And the second part is don't leave commented code out in production. So final piece there is the um, object.keysattachment.length stuff. There's no check to see if keys is actually filled in. Um, there's no check to see if that object is even null. And uh, it's the assumptions are rife there. So no try catch, no null checking, no anything. It is a, uh, it's a dangerous uh, situation just to let that sit there uh, like that because if it blows up, it will blow up with an ugly, uh, ugly message in the background, which the user will not see. And the user functionality um, will be that the user thinks something actually happened and it didn't. All right, so how do we clean all this stuff up? Uh, formatting is one of them. Uh, you'll notice that uh, I'm varring all the variables now. I did a callback. Uh, so that uh, it can be done, you know, I did the old fashioned callback here rather than the get XML answer. And also, you know, you're going to asynchronous on that. Uh, additionally, I put a G format info message in place of any alerts. Uh, this particular one, I commented it as debug, and I want to actually uh, check the response and make sure the answer came back. This one I'll remove prior to production. And, um, you know, it, it would definitely go away. Try, you know, use try catch on everything. So, you know, definitely want to do that. Um, if the answer is actually there, so check to see if answer is null or not. And then, uh, you know, varring the additional uh, pieces. By the way, this objects, I didn't bother checking it. I should have. So um, the object.keys.length. So I, I want to make sure that object was filled in, keys actually had, uh, this keys object attachments actually had some sort of uh, value attached and it wasn't null. This probably would be the only other thing I would add in this case. All right, here's another one. I love this one. All right, never use reserve words. Um, by the way, I'm gonna be posting this deck up so that you'll have access to the links and stuff, but uh, there's a good link for all the reserved words inside uh, JavaScript. Don't use reserved words for variable names. Uh, don't use function names for variable names, reserved functions. There's all sorts of stuff. Don't, don't do this. 
Also, whoever set this up didn't bother to initialize any of their variables. So we have no idea what these are. Um, I went through and investigated all of them in the code proper and did this. As you can see, it's pretty significant, the difference between these vari various variables. I also renamed module to module list, which is really what it was. And it turned out to be an array uh, list of uh, module IDs. We, we got a quick question. Sure. Uh, while calling server script from client side, why do we need to assign extended Ajax class to prototype variable in script include? What's the use of prototype variable created in script include? Okay, I'm not sure I understood the question. Roll it back. Are, are you asking about the prototype um, for a client callable script include? Um, I'll have to wait uh, for the user to respond. Um, I think I know what he's asking. Basically, as far as Ajax is, is concerned, there is a uh, root level J Ajax script include that is inherited by, that's supposed to be inherited by anything that's client callable. And that prototype is then added to that um, inherited from code. So we're building an actual Ajax script include on top of a uh, uh, of an existing script include produced by ServiceNow. When you click the uh, uh, client callable checkbox, it automatically should set you up with a um, um, a template that uh, inherits from that uh, underlying script include. Prototype is the uh, way of extending existing objects in JavaScript. So I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain all that. Really, you know, all I'm trying to do is show examples of uh, from uh, what I found, not get into the uh, whys and wherefores of the uh, actual scripting side. Uh, we can do that at a later session where I can get into, um, you know, in-depth Ajax calls. I've got some best practices in that area that um, would be worthy of a uh, of a session. So maybe we can do something like that. Okay, great. Because someone else has also asked, you know, how to start scripting from scratch. So maybe we can also include some resources. Um, that can be, uh, these can be supplemental, um, your sessions can be supplemental to. Sure. Yeah, no, I can get into some of the, um, you know, I've got a couple of Ask the Expert uh, basics out there. Plus, you can go out and there are, I've got several recommendations as far as coding, um, learning JavaScript, and then uh, going out to the ServiceNow developer site, which has got an excellent series of uh, uh learning how to code to the API, it's the basics. But my biggest recommendation is take the scripting class. Uh, after you've done JavaScript and you got that under your belt, um, Code School, uh, Code Academy, uh, you know, anything like that is a great place to go learn JavaScript online. But then, um, uh, you know, taking the scripting class from ServiceNow is an excellent segue from that. And uh, it's a three-day class and you get the uh, in-depth scripting ability uh, out of that and a lot of really great examples. And we cover things like Ajax and uh, client-side script includes uh, pretty extensively throughout it with some really great hands-on labs. So the um, you know one, two is JavaScript first, get the intermediate level of that, and then go uh, take uh, the ServiceNow class. All right. Great, thanks. Sure. So again, you know, before with uh, no declarations and the use of a reserved word and after change the name of the reserved word to what it really means. Notice I also did that uh, with a couple of variable names, but overall, you know, I, I went out and researched what these actually were and uh, initialized them. <clears throat> now this next one I'm going to show you is kind of interesting. Um, I see this a, a, a lot, and you heard me holler about it a couple of examples ago. No null checking. So if parent is null, this will actually blow up. It will error out and bomb out of the function, and it will roll up to the next try catch if there is one. 
if this is a server side, it'll throw an error and, and drop it into the system log. If it's a client side, it'll throw an error and drop it into the console log. And the user won't know about it either way. <laughs> so make your code at least graceful in being able to deal with problems like this rather than relying on the system to throw an error. By the way, ServiceNow doesn't always throw a JavaScript error. There are multiple uh, places where it will just eat the error. And this is not one of them, but uh, there are uh, conditions and situations where if you know the everything is just right, uh, ServiceNow uh, server side will just gobble the error and that'll be the end of it. On the uh, client side, not so much, but server side, I haven't ha happened quite often. So I try to handle all the errors. I'll use try catch, I'll use null checking, uh, both client and server side. So I'm very, very careful about such things. I want to make sure that I don't get into the situation uh, that I described before where it just tosses the error out there and uh, no one sees it. By the way, make sure that you monitor, or if you are not doing it right now, make sure you're monitoring your system logs on production. Um, it shouldn't be more than a, you know 10 to 20,000 records a day. I kid you not. If you've got more than that, then you've got a lot of stuff turned on for logging that should not be logged. And it will affect the performance of your instance. So be very, very careful about the system log. Make sure that uh, someone anyone is monitoring that in production in development not so much but you know you still want to keep it clean but the uh, production side is it can be a big performance hit because it has to write all those records and i've seen them in the millions of records a day on uh, production so you want to keep it low um get rid of mystery messages, track down all the gs.logs, all of the gs.infos, anything that might be laying around out there, and make sure the only thing getting written out uh, really is error messages. Uh, and then if you do find error messages sitting out there, track them down, find out what's wrong. So here's a couple of uh, possibilities for uh, fixing this up on the client side. Um, if this is a client side animal, you don't have any uh, specialized libraries you can uh, look at, but notice how I first check to see if the ref look um, is, is initialized. I mean, actually it's not null. If it's not null, then I check to see if parents not null, then if parents not null, then I check to see if it's blank or, you know, next one on the, on the uh, server side, we got a nice little utility. Uh, this doesn't work in scoped, but it, um, I've built, I went in and um, made the ability so that it's, uh, it's scoped, um, created my own. By the way, I've got an article out there on how to do that if you're interested. But uh, the JSUtil is a built-in, is created many years ago uh, and utilized heavily by ServiceNow uh, Global Side. And it does all the null and blank and nothing and everything else, unknown checks for you. So you can do this sort of thing. And I can just drop reflock.parent and it'll come back with a true or false on this without bombing. So that's a couple of different ways. And notice I also slapped a try and, uh, you know, it's part of a try catch in front of it to make sure that if anything wasn't captured, <coughs> excuse me, if, um, if something happens here and I didn't check for it, at least I've got, a graceful degradation uh, in the way so that I'm handling the error that's coming out of it. And it's not getting eaten by anything. We had one quick question. Sure. When to use table name, the field name in add query script? Yeah. I, go too, I, I waited too long, huh? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. You know, as far as glide records and stuff are concerned, um, I think you're thinking like a reference field or something like that. It said when to use table underscore name dot field underscore name in add query script. That's all they said. Yeah, I'm not sure okay. if it's um, if you're dot walking, it's whenever you're uh, wanting the value underneath the dot walk. So if I've got a reference field. Um, 
then I dot walk to the information I want. And you're, it's perfectly legal to do that. Again, that's um, more like details inside Glide Records. I actually have an Ask the Expert on Glide Records we did that I, I describe all of that sort of stuff and what's legal and what's not, what works and what doesn't. Um, I did those uh, uh, last year, I think, all the Glide Records stuff. So um, we can uh, we can dig those out and post those out to the site if you want to take a note on that, Lisa. Okay, yeah, because someone else just said they don't use table underscore name dot field name. And then just field yeah, underscore not sure. name did not work for them in the the query. That was a different person that said that. So sure. Let's see. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I highly recommend if you have more detailed questions, our users, you know, please, you know, do use the link and um, and if you have some more details that you can put it on the community and Stephen will answer them um, back on that thread. Yeah, Lisa will make sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, she hounds me until I answer the questions. All right. Uh, that's what she's there for. All right. So, um, yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple of uh, Ask the Experts for some uh, extensive uh, articles on Glide Records and the do's and don'ts, uh, what's legal, what isn't, some of the tricks of the trade kind of thing, uh, what you can get out of a glide record, um, what you can't, uh, some oddball things you can do to glide records, both scoped and um, global. So all that, if you, you know, I've handled that elsewhere and uh, I'm not gonna be talking to it so much here in, in this, uh, in these sessions. All righty, uh, this is one of my pet peeves right here. And I always ding this on my uh, code reviews. This is actual production code. Um, I saw this and uh, couldn't couldn't understand it uh, really as to why this was done. Uh, the reflo.parent dot name field did exist, and um, they just two stringed this. Uh, to get the sys ID and then compared it against the actual sys ID value. The huge problem with this, and it's a really big one, is that this code is um, in danger of, of being um, an error moving from dev to test to prod kind of thing. If these sys IDs already exist in, in um, test and prod as something else, then this reference is bogus because whatever is assigned this in dev may not be assigned the same sys id in test or prod instances so sys ids are extremely problematic uh, you want to get rid of them if at all possible um, there's another problem with this in that this is a check against multiple values and this is very difficult to maintain as you see it. It also is possible for uh, errors to creep in. So a better way would be to get the names of these various parents. Um, and I did a little research on this. I believe those are CIs. We'll see in a minute because reference uh, was parent-child kind of thing. <clears throat> and they were looking for certain parents. The um, uh, these names could then be put into an array of values and an index of can be uh, utilized against it to pull back the uh, a hit. So here's what this would look like. Notice how much it cleaned it up. Okay, so actually it was a location under there. So parent was actually a location and we went and got the name, put it in a variable and did an index of uh, against the array. See how much cleaner this is, how much more maintainable? So much easier. All you have to do is add a new name to the table uh, or to this array, and it's you know easy enough to pull things back. But I went and found all those sys IDs and then changed it to this code. And you can see a significant improvement in the uh, readability, maintainability, uh, it's self-documenting, where this, you have no idea what these SysRDs are at all. And again, the big problem is these may not um, be assigned 
in the same manner on test or prod. Maybe a totally different value. Never trust a society. Ever. Always go for the um, um, a better value that's more maintainable and readable. This was not commented in any way, and I had no idea what these were until I went and looked them up in the table that was being referenced. So you get the idea. This is this is a much cleaner solution. Uh, they both operate about the same speed, believe it or not. But um, you know, it wasn't in a loop or anything. It was just very difficult to maintain code compared to this. Uh, one thing I I would have done extra in here is I would have checked to make sure that uh, reflook.parent was actually filled in, and I would have done a null check. All right. So I love this piece of code. This is, uh, I told Lisa, this is one of the more exquisite pieces of code I have found uh, being facetious. So they declared a variable and immediately changed its value. They initialized it and immediately after changed it. Uh, to this date, I have no idea why this was done, but um, yeah, anyway. Watch out for stuff like this. So obviously no one had done a code review on this. Uh, this left right off the page and hit me in the face. So I'm, you know, it's kind of like, what the, hey, you know. It, the only thing I could come up with is they were doing some sort of debugging, removed the debugging statements, but left the uh, the flip inside rather than just initializing it to false. But anyway, gorgeous, love it. Production code, cool, huh? All right, so one I used to use very, very heavily is gs.log. Um, I don't use it anymore. I instead use gsinfo, and I work with uh, various types of uh, variables to drop into uh, gsinfo, gserror, and gs um, uh, mess. Uh, you, God, I can't even talk today. This has been a bad bad uh, mumbler day for me okay info warning warn and error um those are the three that are preferred usage because they are scope safe and if you ever go to convert your code or you pull code out and drop it into a, um, a scripts background or anything like that and play with it the gs info is transparent so it will work both in scope and global gs.log is not scope safe. It will not work in a scoped application. It will detonate. Now, downside to the GS info uh, stuff is that it doesn't have a built-in location to it, and that's because it has variable replacement capability. What this means is, is that it's limited on how the parameters can be fed into the GS info statement. Uh, in other words, you don't have a source capability like you do in gs.log. It would have been nice if they'd done the array thing and then a comma um, source on the end to allow you to specify a source, but that does not exist. So you have to play the game. And um, in this case, test reference qualifier gets dropped into the one place here, and that becomes my location identifier inside the system log. Where And the system log shows script as, the, uh, as where the code came from usually. In the gs.logs, um, not being scope safe and blowing up, uh, it's the biggest problem. gs.print has the same issue when you're using it inside of the um, scripts background side of things. But uh, interesting stuff. So I've gotten completely out of using gs.log. And uh, the final thing is, is that you don't want to leave these kind of messages in. Um, it's usually used for debugging purposes. And I've got some very sophisticated messages I use for debugging, obviously. And um, I like GSinfo because of the variable replacement stuff. It cleans up the messages, makes things look a little bit easier to read, and uh, overall more maintainable. I use GS error uh, in all my error handling. GS log only does the info message side of things as well and doesn't allow you to specify warning or error inside the system log. So there's some pluses in the on the info side. There you go. All right, another 
piece of very interesting production code, which to this date, I have no idea what they were doing. The only thing I can figure out is they left some sort of um, uh, debugging statement inside their code. Uh, really what I wanted to show here was the variable uh, type flip. So it starts out as an integer and ends up as a string with the same variable. So they're repurposing the variable itself and retyping it uh, while it's you know while it's being executed. This is an exceedingly bad practice. Uh, do not swap the types of your variables. You'll notice uh, when I track down going back a million screens here, when I track these down, this actually types these variables. So I got arrays, strings, objects. You you want this kind of thing. You um, you want to maintain the type. Variables are cheap. It doesn't use up that much space. Go ahead and create a separate variable to hold the separate values. Get back to it here. So don't don't play this game right here where you're repurposing a variable. Um, this makes maintainability difficult. It's a little you know it's a little nicer, a little simpler. Declare the variable, initialize it, and then utilize it. This would have made more sense rather than repurposing it and then using that test later down to print off the information that they were after. And, you know, it's just kind of kind of interesting. Anyway, I would have wiped out this piece of code before pushing it to production because it made absolutely, it had no use in production at all. But again, don't flip the types. And yeah, um, that's the other thing. I, threw a little note up there, this bad practice can cause subtle errors to creep into the code. Interesting enough, serve, um, JavaScript will attempt, in some cases, to stringify things. Uh, once it's been flipped to a string, if you uh, assign other values to it, it may flip it. Instead of going back to an integer, let's say, it may actually flip it to a string. And then comparatively speaking, it may not get it right on uh, some sort of if statement later on when you do an evaluation against that um, those values. So in this particular case, you know, this might evaluate at some weird number if I do a check and it tries to do a string versus numeric type. Um, and since the types aren't the same, it uh, tries to convert one or the other uh, to get some sort of uh, evaluation out of it. And it may actually give you the wrong evaluation. Um, it uh, it may turn them into strings and then try to compare the strings, or it may turn them both into numbers when one is a string and uh, try to compare the numbers. Anyway, again, bad practice, creating a variable. All right, so this one was kind of interesting. So again, back to uh, flipping the variable types. This had all the appearances on the initial blush of being a bad piece of code. It's not the most optimally done, but it's not terrible. The one thing I wanted to point out here is, is that ants is an object. When you're referring to ants here uh, with the brackets around it, you're actually going after properties inside of that object. All right, so the first thing that's kind of bad is that the object is never uh, checked to see if it's empty. And then the tag name is checked here in the if statement, and it's never checked to see if it's null. If it's null, it will blow up right there because it's the same thing as ants.tag name to dot lock it. And uh, the object, uh, if it's null, would blow up, or the tag name, if it's null, would blow up. Okay, then in here where I've highlighted it, this is not a declaration of ants itself. This is actually a declaration of the tag name itself. So this is where the variable is actually being initialized and it's being initialized to an array. So then ants gets ants.tag name and that's equal to an empty array. The other problem with this code um, straight off is that there's no, uh, it was not well formatted. I formatted this thing out and it was very difficult to tell what belonged to the if. So I, uh, I recommended uh, you know, putting the brackets around this, even though there's only a single thing underneath it, just to make it easier to read and maintain um, that and the formatting, of course. Okay, <laughs> here's another one of these. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure why this person didn't use the um, you know initialize on the variable itself. They initialized the variable after declaring it. Uh, don't do this. Uh, this adds noise to the overall uh, codes, you know, the overall list of code. So when you're looking at a script, you do this kind of stuff, and it's it's uh, makes it more difficult to read, especially if you got 10 variables that you're declaring this way. That'd be 20 lines instead of 10. And there is a slight performance hit, believe it or not, uh, especially if this is in a loop and you got a lot of these. Um, it could show up as a actual um, you know, several millisecond hit or several second hit even. So the way that the uh, evaluator works inside of the parser inside of um, uh, JavaScript is that it does line by line. If you do this, it's actually evaluating two versus one lines. Um, it would evaluate that bottom one in a single evaluation. The top one, it evaluates the uh, first line and then evaluates the second. So on startup of the code, the evaluation side actually takes a performance hit in doing this too. Ever so slight, but it's there. So the better practice, the best practice is what you see as a solution here. Initialize your variable on the same line. Okay, side note, try not to use eval. Um, it is in a handful of places throughout ServiceNow's code. It has to be. Everything is data in ServiceNow. So even though the crutch is there, i.e. Um, you know, lean on the fact that ServiceNow has a uh, precedent for this out there, don't make a habit of using eval. Uh, I would highly, um, highly recommend looking at Glide eval, which is actually a safe uh, form of eval if you have to use eval at all. So um, function, don't use it. Uh, eval, you might have to. These are considered uh, to be bad practices overall. I have been able to avoid using eval on everything except for Flow Designer. And in there, I've got some uh, specialized code that Flow Designer does not normally handle. And I've had to use uh, Glide eval to uh, actually make that work. So that's the only one I can think of right offhand where I've had to use eval for anything. But anyway, um, some some interesting stuff here that uh, you want to avoid if at all possible. Okay, another one that I hate. <laughs> so notice the run on error message or info message there under the problem side. Um, very difficult to maintain, difficult to read. Uh, I've seen worse than this where it wraps like four or five lines. Don't play this game. There are better ways of doing this. Um, actually, uh, I prefer variable uh, replacement using GS message um, or get message. I'm sorry, GS.get message. GS.get message allows you to do variable replacement just like GS.info, GS.warn, and so on. Um, <clears throat> with get message, you have that flexibility and easy maintainability of large messages that you're trying to print off. Uh, this wraparound stuff, uh, try to avoid it. All I did was I uh, created a message variable and then formatted the message so that it was easier to look at. It's still not the best way. Um, the gs.get message would be the better way. Let's see if I got that one on here. Yes, I did. So here's the second solution using gs.get message, and it's a lot more easy to maintain. Uh, your variables are in an array, and uh, it allows you to do variable replacement in the message itself. And then you just drop it into the info message. So it's a um, it's a preference issue. Uh, if you prefer doing it this way at the bottom here, uh, the problem one is not the best practice. It's not even a good practice. It's a bad one. The second one's a good practice. This one I consider to be the best practice. Uh, get message is a very underutilized animal. By the way, uh, this one also allows you to set up um, localization so you can use other languages. So get message is. Uh, what that's intended for and it just happens to have this functionality built into it so you get um, you get the added bonus that you can uh, localize your code 
uh, more easily localize your code. Multiple uses. All right, so in ServiceNow JavaScript, uh, we are currently at uh, ECMA 5, uh, ECMA 5 uh, is the version. Uh, we've been desiring ECMA 6 for four years. I guess it came out in 2015 needing it very badly. We're at ECMA 9 out in the real world now. So ServiceNow is four JavaScript levels behind right now. Uh, ECMA 10 is fixing to come out, I think, at the end of this year. So it gives you some idea how far behind we are as far as the actual JavaScript is concerned. That being said, we do have one nifty little thing that we can do in this kind of thing, in this kind of case. And this is highly recommended when you see this sort of repetitive string um, and, you know, I'm, uh, I obviously, you know, for some reason, my underscores didn't come through on my function underscore one and so on. I've renamed all this because it was self-documenting code and uh, wanted to uh, scrub it so that obviously, you know, couldn't be pointed back to where it came from. But uh, what was interesting about this was uh, this pattern kind of leapt out at me. Now, obviously, this could probably be reduced through data to a single function, but I left it as is uh, to give you an idea on um, what could be used as far as literals versus constants. And so there's other ways of rewriting this code, obviously, but uh, I wanted to show that a constant can be used. So we have constants available to us inside of uh, ServiceNow via a um, e Oh, I think we um, lost a little bit of audio just right uh, uh, two seconds ago. Yeah, it looks like uh, I had a drop in my internet. Whoops. Am I okay now? I think so. It looks, it looks yeah. like I'm okay. okay. All right. So anyway, we have uh, ES Next, which will give us the ability to add const. And so um, this code cleans up a little bit. And you can see and my underscores didn't come through. It's really weird. So const incident. And then notice the ES next here. So this is pretty much the only functionality you get out of ES next inside of ServiceNow, unfortunately. Uh, but it is a good one. So if you put this comment at the top, it gives you the ability to uh, then use the const um, structure. And then it becomes easy to maintain this uh, by moving this particular literal up to the top of the code and then using the constants for constant variable all the way down through your code. So highly recommend using this. This is a good practice. Actually, I consider it a best practice, but we'll, we'll go there. And then um, this, I you know consider old practice or okay. I mean, it, 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 it works. It does what it's supposed to do. It's just that if, let's say I have to change this over to some other table, I have to go edit every one of these things wherever I find them inside that code. Whereas here, I just change it in the constant and it automatically changes throughout the rest of them. So constants are your friend. I use them very heavily and uh, highly recommend uh, digging into this. There is a, a whole bunch of information out there on ES Next uh, on the web, but the only one available to us right now in the ES Next library is the const. And I hope, I haven't heard anything, but I hope we get ECMA 6 soon. ECMA 6 brings with it a tremendous amount of new functionality that is badly needed for uh, the JavaScript side of things. And it's backward compatible with ECMA 5. All right, so here's some of my notes on this. Uh, if you want to know more about the uh, const versus var and what it gives you inside JavaScript, I've got a link here. Okay, and that's pretty much it um, for this session. I've got uh, on the next scripting session, uh, which will be in August, uh, there'll be part four and the last part of this. Uh, I'll actually be doing uh, live modifications uh, of some of these, uh, or utilizing some of these best practices by modifying existing code. In other words, I'll have large code snippet with a lot of problems in it, and I'll go down through and show what I do on a normal day-to-day -day basis to clean up the code, make it more functional, easier to maintain, and so on. So I've got 
eh, two or three of these things that are um, fairly large and will give an example of a lot of the things that I do to uh, make co code uh, more maintainable, more usable, um, better performance, all of that stuff. All right, a lot of this stuff can be avoided by just doing the right thing, the due diligence, uh, creating a standard. Uh, there are plenty of JavaScript and ServiceNow standards out there. Um, I've got articles on a variety of things along these lines, and there's been a lot published on it. Uh, JavaScript has got some really great ones. Um, Airbnb has got probably the best JavaScript uh, uh, standard I've seen so far out there. I have a link to it, I believe, in the links on this thing. And make sure you do peer reviews because a lot of the times you're working on testing your code and you got a production deadline coming up and you know you got to remove things, but you might have missed some. And a peer review would catch that uh, usually. So for really the best code review, the best QA of your code, it, it uh, starts with peer reviews. And it starts with uh, the due diligence to get that done. But don't be lazy in what you do. You know, do the engineering, do the extra uh, bit and make sure that uh, you're looking through your code and that you're thinking of it as maintainable. You're thinking of it as, uh, you know, being a little more elegant than just brute forcing it onto the page. Um, you know, avoid some of these pitfalls by using what's uh, what's considered the standard and best practices. Again, rehammer the stuff I had from the last session. Own your code. You know, use error handling. Uh, use comments. Uh, create self-commenting code. Own it. Own it. <laughs> Can't say it better than that. Don't just slap something in there and you know toss it out the door. It is really a reflection on you and your company and uh, ultimately on, you know, uh, maintainability and could cost money if it's done wrong. So do it right. Okay, build solid code, do the right thing, maintainability and error checking and handling. Think of it as a craft. It's not a job, it's a career. All right, so threw out a bunch of um, um, links, same ones from last time, and uh, just want to really uh, hammer some of this stuff home and its availability and uh, what is, you know, what are some of the good practices and best practices. That's it. Do we have any other questions? Germane to the uh, the topic at hand, please. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, someone said, awesome session as usual. Well, thank you. So, thank you. I just said you'd be very pleased to hear that. So um, we're going to wait just a minute to see if any other questions get typed in while we are speaking. And again, um, I put that link a couple times um, in the chat that if you do have more detailed questions, please go to the community. It's, it's free to register, sign in, and just post your questions there, and Stephen can reply. Um, you might also have some other um, colleagues that might be either interested in posting or they can also reply. So we do appreciate um, all the contributions that you all have on the community. And Stephen, we also thank you very, very much uh, for you know providing uh, this insight and information and expertise um, to ServiceNow users. You're more than welcome. We'll be posting the um, PowerPoint from this deck uh, on up into the um, the thread, mm -hmm. into the community thread, yeah, and then uh, also I'll you know a lot of the questions that were asked today I've already written on or done an ask the expert on uh, those particular topics, and we can go ahead and provide that as well. Great, wonderful. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you all on July the eleventh. Yes, yeah, so we'll be doing the next uh, CMDB. That'll be part two. And uh, I'll be talking about how to implement some of the things I talked about in the first seem to be back in February. Wonderful. All right. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>